Okay. Okay. So let's continue with blazers and optical polarization. Um, magnetic fields play a major role in jet physics from launching the jet in close vicinity of the supermassive black hole um, through the collimation and acceleration of the jet uh, to accelerating the particles. So for instance, recent advancements in particle and cell uh, models demonstrate how magnetic reconnection can be used to um, accelerate particles, which leads to ultra fast flares and gamma rays, and also variability in the synchronon part of the spectrum. And then of course, the emission process is strongly affected by the magnetic field. Here we have synchrotron emission, which requires a magnetic field and relativistic particles spiraling in the magnetic field. So it is of utmost importance to study the magnetic field in jets uh, to learn about the physics of jets. So as Dimitri has already pointed out, this is a figure which is often shown in blazer conferences and if this was a prediction, now it has been confirmed. Um, here it is again. So uh, variability of the optical polarization in blazers has been known since the 80s. Uh, so both in the fractional polarization as well in the polarization degree. And as Dima has already pointed out, this is what we would call a rotation of the EVPA since we see a fairly smooth um, change over a uh, period of time moving in direct uh, one direction. And this happened exactly at a period where gamma rays observed with Fermilat uh, showed strong gamma ray flaring. And about 10 years ago, several of those events where gamma rays flared and the optical VPA showed a rotation were observed, uh, which suggests that those two events might be related, as Dimitri has just pointed out, uh, for the case of 3C279. But in, generally, uh, in general, it's not that easy, as Dima has also pointed out, uh, to observe persistent patterns. So um, to really answer the question whether those two events are related, um, a statistical approach is needed. And that was the point of the uh, main Robopole program. So we wanted to ask, uh, answer this question, whether those contemporaneous events of optical polarization rotations and gamma ray flares are actually physically linked or just random associations. For that, the Robopole collaboration built a new instrument which splits a beam into four uh, separate beams and through differencing, you can directly measure the linear polarization in a single exposure. Uh, so the, the whole instrument is explained in this instrumentation paper. This instrument was mounted at the Skinnaker's Observatory in Crete. And with this new instrument, we observed a, a sample of 80 sources, uh, most of them gamma ray loud, so detected by Fermilat, and a control sample of gamma ray quiet sources for four seasons. And we published a series of uh, papers on this subject matter with recently uh, a data release of the full uh, Robopool AGN monitoring campaign data. So I want to point out two main results from the AGN monitoring campaign that relates to rotations or optical polarization in general and uh, gamma ray activity. So you can see the distribution over our monitored sources uh, of the average polarization fraction for gamma ray loud sources and gamma ray quiet. And this shows that gamma ray loud sources are significantly more polarized than gamma ray quiet ones, which provides first evidence that there is a link between uh, the gamma ray and optical uh, emission processes. Uh, for this plot, we went through the following analysis. In our 80 sources, we identified rotations of the polarization angle, and we identified 40 of those events in our main campaign, which lasted for three seasons. We also searched for gamma ray flares in the Fermilat data and then identified the closest flare for each rotation event and calculated the time delays. So what you can see here is the distribution of absolute time delays, and this is shown in the black curve. 
Now let's assume those two events are completely unrelated. We can simulate that by randomly placing our rotations in our observation periods, then repeating this analysis, and we end up with simulated distributions of time delays, which are shown here in gray curves. Then we ask the question, how likely is it that such a simulated um, distribution of time delays lies completely to the left, so to shorter time delays than what we observed. And the probability is fairly low, so we rejected our hypothesis that this distribution is a result of random associations that happen just as a coincidence. The implication, of course, is that at least some, if not all, rotations are related to gamma ray activity. Now, there's a severe problem in uh, dealing with polarization angle measurements, and I want to touch upon that. So let's say I show you two orientations of a line and ask you how much did it rotate? Well, it looks like uh, about 90 degrees, um, but did it rotate clockwise or counterclockwise, or did it actually turn various times before it ended up here? We cannot tell if we just have two measurements. And this is what we call the 180 degrees ambiguity. So we can measure EVPAs um, at different points in time in an interval of 180 degrees. And what we would usually do is we take those and shift them up by 180 degrees to end up with this uh, smooth transition uh, of the EVPA. But now reality kicks in. So here's one of our measured uh, EVP acres from the RoboPol program. This is what we measured. Here, as it's usually done, we assume that the EVPA changes min minimally between uh, measurements. So the only thing that happens here is we shift those two data points down by 180 degrees. Otherwise, the variability stays the same. So we have lots of uh, rotations back and forth, clockwise, counterclockwise. However, if we assume that the EVPA rate, so the speed of the rotation, changes minimally between measurements, we end up with this long, smooth, continuous rotation, and then the rest here does the same thing as before. Now, the problem is we have no clue what's happening intrinsically in this source. We can't tell if this reflects reality or if this reflects reality. And of course, the issue happens around those parts here where we have insufficient sampling to tell if it went down again or if it continued to go up. So time sampling is critical in dealing with EVPA uh, measurements. Here's another example, again, from our RoboPol data. And this is one of our best sampled EVPA curves in the RoboPol sample. Down here, I'm showing the original data. Here, we identified a rotation period. Now, as a demonstration how time sampling affects our results, I've removed every second data point here and every other second data point up here. Um, so one thing you can see is here we identify a much longer rotation than we do down here. That is because we require a certain amount of uh, smoothness uh, to accept data as a rotation. And here we have some short-term variability, which is not consistent with our requirement for smoothness. So this is not considered part of the rotation. But here, by removing some data, we artificially smooth, uh, smooth out the short-term variability and end up with what seems to be a much longer rotation. So that's one of the effects that time sampling can have on identifying rotations. Far more critical is the second part of the data. So we have this variability here. If we drop every second data point, we lose this one and this one, and suddenly this looks like a fairly constant EVPA. However, if we drop every other sec uh, second data point, we lose this one, and suddenly these and these data points appear to align to a long rotation. So by critically undersampling the data, we introduce a fake rotation. On the other hand, one could also imagine that this is just the onset of a really fast rotation, which continued here, which we did, didn't capture due to insufficient sampling. So in this recently submitted publication, we asked the question, how often do we miss rotations? And for that, we used um, weekly sampled data, which was the, the, our main campaign for three seasons and compared it to our fourth season, where we observed a smaller um, fraction of the sample with daily observations. 
And through that comparison, we demonstrated that we would expect to observe three times as many rotations in daily sample data than we did in our main campaign which implies that we must have missed some rotations in our main campaign, in particular faster ones. We also asked the question, how many rotations are affected by the ambiguity? Uh, so for instance, had we detected this as a rotation, we could ask, does it really reflect reality or is it affected at some point by, uh, by the ambiguity, as indeed it is. And we developed the method to, to estimate how likely it is that those uh, identified rotations are measured correctly or incorrectly, and we estimated that probably more than half of the rotations we identified in our main campaign are most likely false detections. So what's the implication for uh, the result that we've presented? Um, so we've claimed that at least some rotations are related to gamma ray activity. And this remains a valid result. Uh, this is thoroughly statistically tested. However, now we know that probably half of the rotations that go into this analysis are uh, fake ones. So one could imagine if that those are responsible for this uh, long tail of long time delays. We still have to test that. So this is clearly one thing what we want to do. Um, let's assume that's the case, then of course our uh, result would end up far more st uh, statistically significant than before. Then on the other hand, we didn't observe all the rotations that must have happened in the data, and we have no clue how that would affect our results. So clearly what we would like to do is to um, go for a new campaign with much better time sampling. And the question is how much better do we need to do? So again, in this paper, we uh, made the following simple estimation. So what I'm showing here is the probability that a rotation, a detected rotation is measured correctly for different rotation rates and durations. And those dashed curves refer to weekly sampling as it was the case in our main campaign. And generally the probability is below 70% and drops off quickly. And in particular, we're not able to detect any rotations faster than about 13 degrees per day because uh, such fast rotations would exceed 90 degrees between uh, data points. And we're not able to recover that from the data. Once we go to daily time sampling, we can observe much faster rotations. And in particular for uh, slower rotations, we would be far more confident that we actually correctly measured those rotations. So um, clearly what we would like to do is to use um, daily time sampling at the least, uh, which is still affordable with a single telescope. Of course, going to multiple telescopes has uh, basically two advantages. On the one hand, we could increase the sample size. On the other hand, if distributed accordingly around the Earth, we could uh, go for uh, intraday observations, which would also be highly recommendable because in the literature, there are cases of rotations which rotate on, a, on an intraday time scale. Um, so with Robopole, we tried to answer this question, whether those events, optical polarization rotations and gamma ray flares happening at roughly the same time are physically linked or random associations. We could show that at least some of those have to be linked, but at the moment we can't really tell which ones and we have missed a lot of rotations and we have a lot of false rotations that go into the analysis. So it's not a really satisfactory result yet. However, uh, this program has strongly um, boosted our understanding of how to ask, ask this question and how to answer, hopefully answer it in the, in the future. So once again, what we really would like to do is to establish a new monitoring program that involves uh, hopefully multiple telescopes and um, Certainly, Skinnaker's observatory should be part of that again. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian, uh, for this very interesting talk and for giving us this uh, overview. Um, questions? I don't see yet any hand raised, but I think some people would like to ask something. <laughs> Let's give some time.
Okay, till somebody, I don't know, thinks of the question or they want to say something. I, I just wanted to ask Sebastian if you could say a few more words about the, the last part of your talk, about the future. Because you mentioned that you would like to have Skinak as being part of this monitoring program and you could do the whole work even with a single telescope. But is it, do you have any robust uh, future plans uh, right now about this or is something that you are still thinking about? Um, well, there are no robust plans of making it happen, um, which um, comes down to finances. Of course, um, well, Skinnaker's Observatory would be interested in continuing such a program, and this is a broad collaboration. Um, so, Robopol that involves also. Um, an institute in India and Poland, which also maintain optical um, instruments. So that would be really good starting point. Um, so there are no concrete plans yet, but uh, clearly it's a thing that uh, also other Blazer conferences lately have, uh, I think clearly demonstrated that there's a huge interest in making mm -hmm. such a thing happening. Yes, and apparently it's just the time, not the resolution, but the, the cadence of the observations. So you just yes. need better cadence and then you have demonstrated what you will be doing with that. Mm -hmm. So it's a very clear uh, scientific plan. 